I'm Kerry Jagger Gustin, your current Arts Council President. Our guest speaker today hails from Tucson, Arizona, and has lived in TUC for two and a half years. He attended the California College of Arts and Crafts and has established a large working studio here. The sculptor is known locally as the artist for the, the monumental sculpture at our spaceport. Please welcome sculptor Otto Regan. I'm going to undertake here in front of mostly people I know. <laughs> almost as big as my family. <laughs> Actually, it is. It, it is. Where are you, Stacy? You've become yes. our family, by the way. And I'm yes. sentimental saying this, but this has been one incredible community. We came here thinking, big building, we'll hunker down, we'll make artwork here, and go elsewhere. Ooh. What we found out was we can't get any work done. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an exaggeration. I mean, there was one night, and I think I can see a few faces here. In one day, we were the eve of going on a, a, a road trip, and six people showed up in due course, and we had a meal. Yeah, you guys know. <laughs> and we need to be packing, and the six people are there, and suddenly here we have the community has been just incredible. It's been very supportive. And so um, it's just great to see all of you. And I do have to sit to part of it. Um, this presentation is kind of different from what I usually do or what I have done. It's easy enough to go to just the slides or images and say, um, this is what I do. This is A, B, C, D, different series and so forth. But what I'd like to do this time, which is different, is to sort of, um, uh, explain in brief the path in the series of sort of crossroads an artist and most artists go through. You don't wake up, to my experience, one doesn't necessarily wake up one day and say, I think I'll work with Sloan Glass, and then have a career of it. If there's anyone who's done that, raise your hand now. <laughs> anyone who's been doing art for a while has a story. So I'm approaching this as more or less my story. Those key moments where um, kind of like there's a fork in the path. And you choose it or you don't. And it makes all the difference. And what I found is there's not one fork in the road. There's multiples. There still are. Even though I'm only 30, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to uh, stay, go through a series of hopefully just snippets of those moments that really made a big difference. I mean a big difference. The fundamental ones and what they kind of grew into. And that will maybe make what I do now, or what I have been doing for most of my career, make more sense. Um, so bear with me. I've never done this. We'll see how this goes. Um, when I was 11. Um, that's right, we're going to go back that close. I don't remember anything before that. But um, actually, no, not 11, I was 9 or 10 years old. Uh, we attended the family of a Lutheran church. Any, um, is there any Lutherans here? Uh, it's not a fun place to be for a kid. And Pastor Paparazzi, um, this is what I remember crystal clear. I don't remember anything he said, I just knew he was always mad. <laughs> and I knew that we were always doomed. I mean, seriously, that's how I felt as a kid. And it was one day, and it changed my life. One Sunday morning, where the sun was coming, now they don't do stained glass. They don't do beautiful buildings. The Lutherans are very practical, they're very minimal. And they had an amber, um, um, and just simple row commercial, amber glass windows. But it was early, and the light was coming through one of those amber panes. And as I was listening to Pastor Paparazzi scold us, <laughs> the light from that amber moved across the floor, moved up the pulpit, moved across his face. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that's cool. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with light. 
And then for the first time, only really, it's, uh, it, it, it changed my orientation uh, in terms of just appreciation. It wasn't the glass, it wasn't him for sure. It was what it was doing. And it, it, I saw life as being alive <coughs> and having its own agency in the sense that it changed the moment and changed how I felt about being here, the heck with him. Mm -hmm. um, when I was 11 years old, I woke up in the middle of the night. This is in Central California by now. We moved a lot. My father was in the Air Force. <clears throat> and there was sort of, I think, I experienced an epiphany. Laying on my back, looking through the window, the corner of my nose, right above my bed. Um, I could see the stars out there. And suddenly I felt, I think a few people here have gone through something similar. Suddenly it felt like I was infused with a sense of purpose. It was something that I was just not another real <coughs> weird acre to do a bigger number than that. I was, there was something different, and then I had a role. And that role was a sense of purpose, and it involved me, and at the center of it, it involved art. And um, I knew who I was. Mm -hmm. I knew it was art. I didn't know any more than that. I didn't know what kind of art or whatever it was. But it, <clears throat> it gave me a sense of purpose, and frankly, I feel that to this day. Whenever I encounter um, an obstruction, I remember that moment. And it, it's kept me going. Because, it, again, if I were to canvas all of you, there's plenty of times when you go, what the heck am I doing? Why am I doing this? How long can I do this? That keeps me going. Uh, <clears throat> next, next snippet is um, as a freshman in high school. I won't take you through um, how I got kicked off the football team, <laughs> but um, I was going to go dance with the Indians, which I was really into. And I told my coach, and he said, "Well, I can't tell you what he said." <laughs> the first game, I was kicked off the football team. Now the coach of the football team was also the art teacher. So here I am in high school. And in the, in the classroom, he was very reasonable. He was actually a decent teacher. At the end of the first year, my freshman year, he said, you know, I don't know what to teach you. You're going to have me for four more years, three more years. And, um, and he's the only art teacher. So he handed me a flyer from the California College of Arts and Crafts, which is in Oakland, which is 100 miles away. And he said, you know, they do weekend classes and gave me the flyer. So for the next three years, I took a Greyhound bus at 3.30 in the morning to, to Oakland every weekend and then hung out as long as I could. That happened to be, by the way, the same period of time as the Mario Salvador free speech movement. Um, and got, you know, that was the launching place. It was a very politically charged place, Berkeley and Oakland. Um, so experiencing all that um, kind of really opened up the world to me, but the classes at CCAC. Suddenly I had some, the first teacher was Jacques, Jacques Pébert. He was from France and had a, you know, had a beret. Uh, beret, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and goatee, I mean, he was the cliche of every child teacher from France. <laughs> and um, he was so fundamental, he took you through every single step. We spent a whole week on just the nose, on the proportions of the face and so forth. So the fundamentals I learned by starting as a sophomore year um, was, a, was a foundation which really um, uh, was very helpful. <clears throat> the other thing is while I was in the Bay Area, um, I came to appreciate uh, Bopano, and if you know who the sculptor is, um, who was still alive at that time, and Mark Adams. Both of them worked in many different mediums, and they, both of them worked in the public realm. And that was the first time it registered to me that your artwork doesn't just have to hang on a wall. Mm -hmm. It was more than two-dimensional. I never used notes before. But I figured I'd get lost if I didn't do this. Um, I went to college, when I started college, uh, that year I got the draft number 22. So yeah. that was that. Yeah. Out of 365, many of you know what that means. Yeah. That means I'm going to be a Tom. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and that was not in my program to do that. But it was a big pressure. I had to keep up 16 units or I'd, I'd be drafted. Um, 
and meanwhile, um, what I, I took on, a, how did this work? As a freshman in college, I also joined up on a competition for a local college, Mercer College, to build a new library. They wanted a 1,200 square foot mural. And so I competed for that, and that was my first commission. I'd never done a mural, I'd never worked in clay, it was a clay mural. And it was 1,200 square feet, and I was 19. If any of you from California, I went to Han, excuse me, Han Sung Company, and Stan Bitters was their lead artist who was working there. And they did environmental ceramics, huge projects. Um, and so they were my partner in the project. So that got completed, and that was basically the beginning of my relating to the public realm in terms of actual work. Um, the second year of, of uh, college at CCSE, I lived one block from Berkeley, and I hung out in the architecture department at Berkeley just to sort of absorb it. I found myself loving architecture and considering it as an alternative. But also, um, that was at the peak of, of uh, dissent, public dissent of the war. And um, <clears throat> the second half of the semester at CCAC, which I could barely afford to go to, they su suspended all classes for protesting the war. And, <clears throat> and I did that. The downside was, is I was broke and I couldn't afford to keep going to school and not getting classes didn't make sense. So at that point, I kind of developed this sense of um, mission again. And that was, if you're going to fight so hard, politics were every, everywhere in Berkeley. Um, so you have to decide what you're going to fight for. And the fight against the war was perpetual. And I thought, I'm not a soldier. But I have to choose what I'm a soldier for and commit to that. And it wasn't going to war, it wasn't fighting the war. It was doing what I do, what I had, even though I didn't have a career at that point. Um, eventually, I got out of the draft. That's a story in itself. Um, 4F, for mental reasons. <laughs> yeah, it's actually true. And I assume, and I assume well, I, it's not mental, but that's what they gave me. Um, I assume that meant I could never teach, which was actually the wrong assumption to make, which was one of the options you have as an artist to teach or be really good. Um, that's <laughs> um, so, um, once I got out of the draft, I went to Europe um, on fumes. Uh, I sold a few paintings. I was painting by then. And I uh, went to Europe, and that introduced me to great museums, and, uh, timeless architecture, a whole different sense of how culture can relate in, a, in the fabric of a community into your daily life, as opposed to California, where everything goes up fast and comes down fast. Very different world. And, and I, I really uh, um, uh, associated with that, identified with it. My father was Austrian after all, so it was kind of easily fair. Um, <clears throat> at, um, at 20 years old, I'd gone to, um, to Europe. I had to come back because I got sick. When I came back, I thought, this is you know, not where I want to be. So I went to the Italian consulate in San Francisco. I still don't know how exactly I did that. And asked for a scholarship to go to the La Academia de Belle Arte in Florence. And they gave me a scholarship. <laughs> Incidentally, when I got there, it's a state-run school. So the scholarship would have cost me $12. The equivalent of $12. So, but whatever gets you there. <laughs> when I was there um, looking for an apartment, I ran into by accident a painter named Richard Estes. Do any of you know the photo realists? Um, <clears throat> he was also looking for a place to work and live in Florence, and, and so we looked for places together. And uh, he said, he pretty much insisted, once you get finished in school, you should go to New York City, where he lived. He's a, um, at that point, his paintings were going for a quarter of a million dollars, and that's not. You know, not even 1970, 71, mm -hmm. you can imagine. Um, and he's still working. Um, <clears throat> so I, I got back, I went to school, I got through the school year, I went to London, because I didn't want to come back to America, got a job at the theater, where I worked backstage at Her Majesty's Theater in London. And um, Laurent McCall was the, uh, uh, this applause, applause was the, <laughs> was the play, and I worked backstage. And I was running the ropes about five feet from her changing station. And um, she was the only, I was the only American there, and she liked Americans. So that created, it was 
just fine. This <coughs> relates to nothing else I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but while in London, this is a year, year and a half after I met, yeah, a year and a half after I ran into uh, Eskison. Uh, I was walking with some friends to, to Piccadilly, which is really near where the theater was. And at that moment, or at that time, the American realists were having a show at the Serpentine Gallery. It's the first time American realism was introduced to Europe. And one of their posters was a Dwayne Hansen picture. Of what, it was um, something that no one had ever seen that over there before. And I was explaining to my two friends what realism was. It wasn't something I was necessarily into. I was just basically recognizing it. I had a friend that was part of it. And this Bentley pulls up to us on the side road and jumps out four people. One was um, Alan Stone, the name of, he used to work with Castelli. And then Richard Estes. They both popped out of these doors and were standing there facing each other. I said, well, this is meant to be. So he said, go to New York. Go to New York. So I did. I got, eventually I got out of London, took a ship to, to um, New York. Uh, and as a student, we get cheap tickets and um, um, a farmer student anyhow. So <clears throat> anyhow, I went to New York, I tried it, and I realized, and I bet you anything, some of you understand this really well because you're here. <laughs> but but I, 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 I figured out that there's no horizon. You know, I was living on the lowest level you could possibly live, given my budget, and the sun comes up at 10, 10.30 and goes down at 1.30 or 2. <laughs> you don't have this, you have this. Yeah. And I couldn't couldn't adjust. Um, I figured out at that point I'm a Westerner. I'm from the West. Mm -hmm. Born in the desert, I live in the deserts, and I love the deserts. So I came back, went to the Bay Area, which is not a desert, <laughs> and I took up uh, an apprenticeship, which is similar to the mode of learning in Europe. I did an apprenticeship with uh, stained glass, with Cummings Architectural Glass in San Francisco. And while I was there, <clears throat> I started meeting artists who were doing, who were approaching glass as an art, not as an ecclesiastical or decorative medium. Okay. And there were so many of them that I, as I networked, I figured out, God, these guys should be in a book. And, um, and more importantly, it's not the East Coast. <laughs> this is a West Coast, initially it was a West Coast phenomenon. So I you know, got on my flag, and not knowing how to do this, um, I started, talking about it. And by accident, some guy, a friend of a friend, introduced me to a publisher. Now all of those of you who are writers <laughs> realize just this, it's kind of so circumstantial. The work, the work that most writers put into getting a publisher, I did not experience that. But a friend of a friend let me to a publisher. That publisher couldn't pull it off. By then I was too committed. I figured I'd publish it myself. And then an art agent went out in LA said, you should try to sell it. So the first publisher I went to said, well, take it. San Francisco Book Company, and I published my first book. And it's about the West art on the West, glass art on the West Coast. Twenty-four artists. And um, that led to um, that led to uh, uh, McGraw Hill, through my publisher in San Francisco. McGraw Hill said, "We'll do your next two books," and they put me into a contract on that. And um, uh, while I was doing the glass book, one of those 24 artists was James Hubble, who does Antonio Gaudí-like architecture. And, um, and he was one of six people I would consider um, you know, outsider, visionary, maverick sort of thinker about how we live. And um, I would like to do six of them. I had six, Paul Osler was another one on a different scale. And so, so they put me on a two-book contract to do six visions. And, but first they wanted me to do one vision. So I did it, my second book was the, From the Earth Up. I wrote just about James Hubble, and I'll show you a couple pictures of his work. Um, that put me on the lecturing circuit, and so for the next four or five years, I was lecturing like crazy. And then by, um, by the time I was 31, uh, I had done three books, I had written four and five, and I quit, but I'm not doing that. I was off course. And um, <clears throat> so I moved to Santa Fe and lived there for three years until I ran out of money. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I just simply could not launch myself. And in the meanwhile, I was not just doing some glass, but I was painting and then I started experimenting with sculpture with found objects and 
combining structural forms pierced with glass, because glass has a structural value that's underestimated under compression. In other words, you could put a brick wall with, with glass going through it, and as long as all the surfaces are clear, I'll take me too long. Um, so, that, so I thought I've got to get, I have to support this, how do I get started? I didn't know how to work with any material or work with scale, and um, uh, at one point, I, I, I said, I, would, I will move anywhere where I get supported for my own, even Cleveland, <laughs> which I really said. And I've never been to Cleveland, my apologies. <laughs> but I thought, and I, once again, through a friend network, um, I was asked to make a sculpture in Phoenix, the real thing. So I moved to Phoenix. Um, uh, once that sculpture was done, uh, I also joined into a competition on Southwest Sculpture um, at the Scottsdale Center for the Arts. And after that, I had almost 30 offers for representation, and, and which was just crazy. And then I got a full, within a year and a half of living here, I had a museum show, to make a long story short. And the gallery I picked up was back in Santa Fe, where I couldn't, people wouldn't answer my calls. And that gallery was Santa Galleries at that time, it's not there anymore. Um, they gave me a full page in North America and, uh, of one of my sculptures, and I'll show it, images similar. And, um, and then my career was launched. And so for, <clears throat> for um, gosh, from 36 to, um, um, for 14 years, uh, I was in Phoenix just barely keeping up with things. There's so much to do. And just, again, I'll, I'll show you that image soon. <laughs> and then, then from there, um, I couldn't stand living in the city anymore, so I moved back to Santa Fe, and then from Santa Fe to Bisbee, um, to lower my overhead, and then from there to Tucson to try to get work, and then from Tucson, and all, all it took a while I'm getting projects, but not, not too many. And um, at one point, um, I was exhausted, it was about five or six years ago, and I said, I'm going to put my studio, this is in Tucson, I'll put it in um, storage, and I will <coughs> just take a break. I've never had a sabbatical. It was self-sabbatical. Self and I took an appointment at UC Merced, University of California Merced, the newest of their campuses. And they asked me to be artist in residence and to do a public art master plan. So that's the last publication I ever put together was a master plan for the newest university in the UC system, fastest growing university in North America. And um, while I was doing that, I met another artist named Stacy Hay. <laughs> she was having a show in, in, in uh, Merced. And um, I was, it was my duty to go to every opening. I mean, I actually do that because I'm interested in it. every opening, I went to every, met as many arts as possible. And that part probably is a story will be told the day. But Stacy and I, once I was done at UC Merced, decided to move here. And that's what put, puts us here now, to sort of restart here. Um, so let me go to the images, and better go to them quickly, or we're going to be over an hour fast. <laughs> if you can go ahead and get the light. Um, okay, I didn't do that. Um, that's a gorgeous mic. When I was living in the, in, the, in the valley, when I was living in the San Joaquin Valley, by the way, that's where we're set. Um, uh, this is the kind of nature you grow up with. I love gorgeous. And I love the order, I love the predictability of what every single part of that system is unique. Okay. So, yes? You've been asked to speak up. Oh. Speak up. Oh. That's a good idea. Yeah. Ready? Yep. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Did I slur the first half of my <laughs> uh, the next slide. So just quickly before I get into public works, while I was writing the books, writing the books, so this is before um, I got into sculpture, uh, my partner and I at that time, she was uh, a stained glass artist and had worked for James Hubble, who I wrote the books about. And, um, and one of the ways that we paid the rent was to keep doing, we did some glass. And I stopped this way back in my uh, mid-30s. Uh, Next. This is just a couple of details from windows. Wow. Next, okay, stick there. And then, so doors, windows, it's a common thing, a common sort of range of what you do with stained glass. 
But again, this is what we did to kind of keep the rent paid while we both made what we could consider our higher art. Uh, next, as a detail. Nowadays, I can't even get this glass again. It's how old handmade glass from Europe. It's getting rarer and rarer. So that whole phenomenon of doing stained glass that started from the 70s and 70s is, is petering out. Um, so this is the first book. It had the 24 artists. On the cover is um, a picture of uh, one of the windows by Mark Adams, who I mentioned that in my high school years I had encountered in San Francisco. And he was like the grand artist. He did massive tapestries. He did stained glass, and he uh, was a great painter. Um, he's, he's now passed away. And so this was kind of the finish of a loop to kind of go back, and he was one of the 24. Um, in the process of doing this work, um, I met one of those artists was James Hubble. And so go ahead and go to the next picture. Uh, which led me ultimately to uh, doing the, my second book, which is one sixth of the part of the bigger book, which is to follow, which didn't. Um, and he was a, what I would call an, I don't know, for lack of better expression, organic, um, driven artist, aesthetically speaking. Uh, this is the cover, and that's, uh, that's the, the, there were so many things about him, so we won't go too fast here. Um, his aesthetic is completely different than mine. What I absolutely fell in love with and, and, and turned him into a mentor for me was that he was so liberated. He was not um, fixated on sort of the limits that most people sort of assume to be part of their creative process. But this, is, this building is one of seven or eight buildings on the top of the hill. And this is outside of San Diego, in San Diego. Um, that's part of his hill. And there's a swimming pool, there's a boys' bedroom, that's the boys' bedroom. You go up, the boys in the mid morning, there were three boys, they would walk out that door, walk across the top of the hill, past the pool, and down to the kitchen, which is separate from the parents' bedroom, which is separate from the studio, which is separate from the storage room. Even the storage rooms were like pieces of sculpture. And so uh, I was enamored with my, my love of architecture, for one, but the other thing was that he demystified doing whatever you want, <laughs> almost whatever you want. Next. So if you go in that front door, that's the shower, not the shower, the well, it is, it's a shower bath, and that's the skylight over it. Now, all, all my pictures that went into the book, I've never scanned, so I took these off the web, but you get the idea. <laughs> uh, and and uh, you, well, there's something in here that's worth pointing out. Yeah, it's not very well visible, but right here, those straight lines, mm -hmm. that's plate glass piercing the wall. Mm -hmm. And that probably is where it planted the seed. You can, you can use this glass in other ways than you normally use it. It's not just a plane, it's actually a process of transmitting light as well. Next. This is inside the same boy's bedroom. And as you can see, he doesn't leave anything alone. <laughs> I lived here a lot to wear the, the bunk on the right. Okay, next. And what happened when I was doing this book, this is afternoon glass, of course, just a couple years later, I was 28, I think. No, no, 26. And um, uh, I spent uh, all that time just walking around and taking photographs. Again, none of these are of his price or mine, um, which became part of the book. Okay, next, that's a studio. Uh, this is the glass loft where all the stained glass is done. It looks like the belly of the whale, doesn't it? Um, next. Oh, now Stacy said I really had to put this picture in. <laughs> I, I, I would rarely it. Um, but this is a portrait of the three of us, well three, because he considered this Chinese uh, uh, ancestor painting as his grandfather. And if you really look at it, it's sort of like, it's conceivable. Um, but he, he became a, a sort of a mentor I never had. And, and having sort of walked away from getting a continuing higher education after two and a half years, not counting Europe, um, uh, I was going a different route. And having the right person to sort of mentor you as you go through was essential. So that's James Hubble and myself, of course, and Grandpa. Um, the first book on, on Hubble was um, uh, The Palace Stories of Abu Dhabi. He got a prize. By the way, in the mini mom, McGraw Hill didn't honor the two book contract. They stopped their general books division, and so I wasn't to do six visions. 
and I wasn't able to do any other contract. I was stuck in that, in their ownership. And by the time I got out of it, <clears throat> Hubble had gotten a project based on the first book I did on them to do 18 doors for a palace. And so I thought, this is a quickie and it'll be fun. So I set up underneath the glass studio and as they put together each door, I photographed them and then they went off never to be seen again, which is the way it is in the Middle East. This went to a pot palace, none of us would ever see it. And that's where politics changed dramatically. Um, this is the front, one, of the, one of the sets of doors, next picture. <coughs> this is each other door. All this was being done in studio. Most of the, what, most of the, of the, of the doors were rosewood. Uh, next, this one's not, this one's actually bronze. So those were the two main doors, and that's all I'll show you. But he explained it this way, his, his reasoning for the de uh, decoration, um, uh, or, or de decorativeness, what would be the word, um, decorativeness, th that uh, the Middle Easterners, and this was explained by the architect, he said, people love dessert. And, and no matter how sweet the dessert is, they'll put honey on top. <laughs> so he said, that's what I'm going to do aesthetically. That's what you're seeing. Next. So back to the um, to, back to the San Joaquin Valley. One of the things that I had looked at and, and didn't know how to use it for the longest time is I was fascinated by the fact that you can look down and see up. You have earth there, but you also have sky there. Next. So none of the images of my my work now is is uh, chronological. I'm going to skip around. Um, but from that sort of initial um, appreciation of this idea of the furrows being irrigated and seeing the sky, and the earth actually became semi-transparent. Um, you, could, you could imagine it anyhow. I started this series of taking scraps of stone and um, yeah, cutting them uh, and then inlaying glass. And the back side of the glass is mirrored, so they reflect out. But, it, but it, they also all go on the wall, which we're familiar with. So this was a series which I really kept going because it reminded me of being a painter. Next. Mm. <clears throat> um, this and 25 more uh, wall sculptures went to um, Little Now uh, Development uh, in Aspen. Are they backlit? No. No, none of the, none of the wall pieces are backlit. None of my sculptures are artificially lit. They're all based on passive manipulation of the light. So these pieces need to face a window or a light source because the back of the glass, it's basically stained glass or, or regular flip glass, it's put into the stone, cut to follow the, uh, the, the uh, topography of the, the surface of the stone, then I mirror the back of the glass. So any light that goes in, just like any hand mirror, reflects right back. Next. And then there's, you know, a hundred variations of using these I call them topographies, and they do, they do remind me of landscapes. Next. Um, once in a while I would get into these where I would just take a work uh, of stone and hit it with a sledgehammer. Okay. Rick Dillingham, if anyone knows of his pottery, it's, it's similar. He would break his pieces and then reassemble them. Okay. And um, so I got into kind of doing that, so that's an example of being a little more arbitrary in the approach. Next. This is jumping up in scale. This is cast glass. It's also, I don't know if I've had it mirrored yet, but I'm preparing it for inlay into a stone. Next. This is like a three or four inch thick piece of stone, so it's quite heavy. And then the larger, thicker cast glass, and here you can kind of see the mirror a little bit better than the previous. Um, next. They're all held, uh, installed with a French cleat, which is, a mad, which is an excellent method for hanging really heavy stuff. Um, the topographies, I've used them in many public commissions. This one is actually, excuse me, private. It's in Dallas, and it was a three-story uh, condo on the top of a high-rise in downtown Dallas. And he wanted me to do the whole stairwell, so we designed the, um, I didn't physically design it, but I asked for them to sort of float the staircase in front of the wall. And so it goes up 40-some feet. And these are all really thin pieces of, of um, what we call in the trade, rough backs. That they're, they're the, Textural skin is on a block of stone when it's put in the core. And, um, and then I inlaid um, flat glass that had been mirrored, same as the enlarged version of the of this pieces I showed before. Next. This is second story looking down and up. 
and it keeps going another floor up, and from here another floor down. Next. This one, this is in Maui, and the, um, uh, the designer, I knew the designer for this place, and was, where the stone piece is, is actually a window going into uh, the di uh, kitchen. And so it's not actually reflecting the light you see on the bottom left, uh, or the metal piece, you're actually seeing the light on the other side. So light worked both ways. It's both reflective and transmitted light properties to this. But I just thought I'd show this as sort of a, another variation. Next. Oh, and then just doing pattern work, playing with glass and stone, not being so much topographies, but also working off the wall. This is a, these are sketches of possible patterns that use repeated motifs. Next. So what I did is cut glass, that's cast glass. It's about an inch thick, and then mirror the back, and then cut the stone to the same modules, and then start playing with them. Next. Um, so this has gone beyond sort of the topographies, and it's becoming more of an assemblage, I guess. Um, next. This one doesn't photograph well, or I don't have any, it's long gone. But all, we've all done this, I'm sure of it. You pick up a stone, you can't leave behind. <laughs> and, uh, and then what do you do with it? But you know, you, you, there's something. And so I, uh, I had a couple of trees, and you'll see those in the next slides, where um, they were, they were um, destroyed by development. Phoenix was, had, there was nothing sacred in Phoenix. Yeah. It's one of the fastest growing cities in the United States, and the reason why is nothing gets in their way, including trees. And um, so I started, collecting interesting tree carcasses. And then eventually the bark would fall off. So this is the bark of one of those trees. And what I did here is took the different bark, probably from different types of trees. And um, I, I mounted them, suspended over these three panels, which is linen on wood, on the left and right silver leaf, and the one in the middle white gold and then pure gold. And then next slide, slide, slide. And then each of the pieces have pure pigment on the back. Now this is what doesn't show well. Because they're suspended, when you look at it straight on, even though you don't see the color, you see the glow of the color. It's called halation. It's not, not the color, it's what it does in space, in a very small, subtle way. And so they look like they're floating on color. It's incredibly subtle though, and, that, and this is a lousy picture. Next. On a bigger scale, this is also found material at the quarry. The quarry, by the way, is in Berlin just up the road. That's one of the reasons to live here. It's close. <laughs> and then, you know, since 1987, I've been commuting from wherever I live to do the work there. Um, one, so it's become very familiar to me. One of the things that they have, they do in their processes is when they saw a large block, a large block is five by five by 10 feet. They're turning it into slabs or whatever they're gonna do with it. When they're sitting underneath the blades, they need to level it. So they put on pieces of wood cover with plaster, set the stone on it so there's no movement. Mm -hmm. Well, you do that over and over and over again, and pretty soon the wood is, is junk to them. So I started collecting those pieces of wood and doing what I call quarry boards. And um, what I do is, in this one and the next couple, is I bevel, you know, just hold it there for a second, I bevel the edges and then put 22 karat gold on it. And when gold faces gold, imagine the beak, you can see this little V shape. Yeah. Um, the closer you get into this groove, uh, the closer the gold gets to the other reflective surface of gold. And so again, it creates a halative, not reflective, halative process um, where film won't catch it, but you would when you see it with your eye. That there's color that sort of migrates above it, and so it vibrates. And it's junk. It's just junk with 22 karat gold on it. <laughs> <laughs> Next picture. This is just a bigger one before it was shipped off. I think that's probably 12 feet by eight feet or something. Or I don't remember. But whenever I had enough boards, and they did lots of variations. They, all these are just based on a simple grid. But it gets the point across. Uh, next. This is one of the trees. This is one of the trees that I found that was uh, destroyed you know, in, in, um, in development. And I peeled the bark off of it, and it was a, a scar. Everywhere you see the gold was a scar. And um, 
So I carved into that scar this geometry and then gold leafed it. Mail. Now, 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 Notification. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad it's not mine. The guy who turned the sound off. But yeah, it's just step on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the gold, I mean, basically, it's too, and I turned the tree upside down, so those are actually branches, not roots, out there. So basically what I'm doing is trying to make something that was garbage precious. Um, and of course, the vehicle is light again. And that's how, what I call a low stone or a milestone, and I'll get to those later. Next. How big was that? About five feet. This one's about eight or nine feet. And um, both of these are in storage in Tucson, and we have to get them here. Um, I never sold them. Um, same thing, tree turned upside down. And um, I use, you can't see in this picture, it's pretty poor. On the very top, you can kind of see some cracking. And that cracking was the bark spreading in a really beautiful geometry. So all the carved grooves and where the glass went simply follows where the tree was naturally cracking. That's glass wrapped around the top with mirror inside, of course. And then gold, and then that brownish limb, that's asphalt. I took asphalt and reduced it, reduced it, reduced it, until it turned into like a stain or a film and rubbed it. And I thought that, that was appropriate, given the fact that this thing was considered garbage. Next. Phoenix challenged me to take three days of their broken bottles and stem winner and do something with it. And so I created this, <clears throat> this is actually hanging in, in my studio at the time, not in the restaurant. But I took the broken glass and I found a metal lath, got two different patterns of metal lath, overlapped them, and then just stick, stuck the glass through it. And again, found. Okay. Now taking it to a different scale, here again is that reflective phenomenon. Um, next. <clears throat> One of the, um, the saws that really fascinated me, you can see the blades in the lower left, the top of the blades. Those blades cut a huge rock into slabs. But the amazing thing is, is they cut it so flat that you can sandwich a piece of glass in it, mm -hmm. put it under torque, and the glass doesn't break. Mm -hmm. Because surface to surface, you're not giving it a point though. You're not doing this with the glass, you're doing this with the glass. Mm -hmm. And so um, this goes back to, this is so fundamental to my work. In fact, my first sculptures were made from this process. Next. So this one is, is um, taking those slabs. Now in this case, I've laminated glass that put, went up and down inside of it. That's probably uh, seven feet higher, eight, seven feet, I think. Um, and it was a variation of this that was in Art in America that kind of started my career. I call these monoliths. Next. These are two, uh, th I, I chose two different stones to create a variation for a client in Tucson. These were just the stones, go to the next one. She, she took the one on the left. And then again, there's, there's some of them that are really fine with just single layers of glass between stones, and I don't have any images of those, so I apologize. So you're just sort of seeing the bulkier, bigger ones. Next. Markers. Markers is when there's a lot of irregular stones at the quarries, a lot. I mean, probably more irregular or throwaway material than there is usable material. And um, one of the throwaways is anything that's too irregular to turn into flat planes, which is their mark, you know, for tiles or wall, uh, like, excuse me, countertops and that kind of thing. So this is a, my markers are simply when I take a rock and I start shaping it with their saws and seeing what I can find into it without taking away the original stone. So on the other side, you'll see mostly stone. This side, I've almost completely manipulated. Next. Um, this was a piece of sandstone that was buried in the, um, uh, in the soil. This is just a slice off the end of it. But this was underground, and this was overground. That's called desert, desert glaze. Uh, but a really substantial desert glaze. And so next. So is the glass on this one also? Are those little single panes? Yeah, these, this is actually double. If you know glass, it's just double strength glass. And float glass is what we have everywhere. It's just a regular clear glass, more or less clear, has a green tint to it, greenish tint, green blue. Um, and so the color you see in these is, comes from using that, it's called float glass. And it's a, I forget what the, I'm getting out of, I'm losing my sharpness on what, call, I want to say iron oxide, but I don't think so. Um, and then I, I cut them to the shape. I make a, I never make the glass 
emerge beyond the stone. I'm following the stone. Could you go back? It doesn't really, this is a late, well, this is a pretty flat stone. But the glass, once I create the little folds that, that ease into where the glass is, and that's all done by hand, then I make a pattern. This is probably easier to show on another sculpture, but let's just do it now. So on this edge is different than this edge. And so I make a pattern of both, and I'll establish how many layers of glass there are, and then I make a little topographical map that, that sequences from one side to the other. And then I hand cut, cut them, and then sand the edges, and then clean them, and then laminate them, and then mirror them, and then put them in the stone. And okay, then. So these all have mirrors on the back side? Where, when they go all the way through, they don't, when they're in anything that, any section that's in the stone is mirrored. So both the left and the right side of these segments of glass are mirrored. Half of this thing is, you can see right here, that little, that's the edge of the stone, right there, the line. So the glass above that is clear, and because the wall is dark, you don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, next. You can see it easier here. You can see that right there, that part, you're looking through at the color of the wall. And then this part is a curved mirror. Mm -hmm. Next. Yeah, that, that shows it even better. Next. Um, gold, my use of gold, I know I can't control this, but it, it's not about wealth or excess, it's about life. It's about what it does. And, and 23, 24 karat never you know, um, oxidizes. So what these things can do in light is just amazing. And um, so yeah, this is just me playing with, the saw has four axes. Uh, five, this one has five, which means it also can, aside from a flat blade going left and right, it also can kind of go up and down while it's cutting. So I started playing with the flutes and, and arcs next. And I did it there here too, but this one's not gold leaf, but you can see gold glass, gold amber colored glass on the top and in the middle. Next. Columns are vertical works, which, you know, are like columns. Columns. And this one is a fence post, one of my very earliest pieces. It's a fence post from um, Kansas. They use a lot of limestone for fences. They even have full, I don't know if anyone's ever seen them, but limestone barns um, made out of stone. Um, so this one I was able to procure, and I just basically scalloped it out with the saw on both sides, and then um, put the gold in it. Uh, it's interesting, this one, um, I'm trying to remember how it happened, but I got a commission from uh, Japan to do something similar, but 10 feet tall, and about almost, uh, almost 18 inches square. It, it added up to being over two tons. Uh, and and then the air created it. <laughs> I, I never saw the bill, but it was, it was, it was two days later, two three days later. I got a call from the installer, and I get, it's hard to believe. Money on that level is beyond me. Next, so here these are more sort of conventional columns. Now I didn't really explain this. I should have showed pieces of the quarry itself and all the scraps. But when, when, the, when the quarriers want a stone, and they import them now from all over the United States, not just mining here in New Mexico, they usually come imperfectly. In other words, the cube they want is five feet high, five feet wide, 10 feet long, and fits in their saws. Ideally, it comes like a big ice cube, and there's nothing weird about it. There's no fissures in it or cracks. But usually, there's a rough edge, because when you break out sedimentary material, it breaks it regularly. And almost always, both sides. So they take them into the plant and shave off. Think of a baked potato, and you're taking off the potato peel, and you're see it in the middle of it. They take off the potato peel, which they call a rock back, and then, um, and then they throw it away. So my career is based on rock backs, my stone career. Um, all these are very thin, maybe four inch thick rock backs, and, I, and, and they're very thin, but if I cut successive pieces, I can take two pieces of the rock back and put it together like this. Mm -hmm. It makes a column. Uh, and then I cut out a, um, um, like a trough, 
in the middle, so the stainless steel that runs through it and connects it to the base, so it's stabilized. <clears throat> um, and that's what all these are. They're, they're, I call them two-faced columns, which is not, uh, can be read the wrong way, I suppose. Next, <coughs> these are three-faced columns, so I'm taking rough backs and taking three slices and assembling them in sort of this uh, tetrahedral way. Uh, the fellow who owned that, by the way, was these two pieces, he's still alive. Uh, he was the vice president of um, Herman Miller. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was the guy who was the bridge between the factory and the artists and the stories he had to tell. <laughs> Charles Eames. <laughs> well, yeah, Charles Eames was among them. And um, the artist, not him, he had some Schwartz, um, Joseph Schwartz is the actual VP. So he had prototypes. His house was full of prototypes from her mother. And so I begged to trade the sculptors for the prototype. And they didn't go for it. Um, uh, next. Uh, reconstructions is, a, is similar to what the previous series, but here, I'm, now these are models. I'm cutting apart the stone in a more elaborate way and then even more irregularly making openings or channels for glass and then reassembling the stone, and I call that a reconstruction. This is probably the first one ever I called it digit, um, but allowed me to get away from the straight lines. <clears throat> um, next. Uh, this was for a, uh, an accounting firm in, in a Chandler, I think. And uh, it's basically a take, my takeoff on Abacus. Mm -hmm. But that's the model on the left, and that's the way the podium or pedestal was built this sort of like a cap chamfered edge. And then um, this is the back side at the bottom and the front side uh, on the top. You can really see the rough back. There's the rough back side, there's the flat side they cut off from the main block. Mm -hmm. But I staggered it. Um, next, these more models. This is for a client in um, uh, Dallas for a sculpture, a private sculpture garden. And they chose, I think, the one in the middle. And often happens is when someone chooses something, I cut one or two of the others. And um, so the one on the bottom here is out of sandstone. This is rough, this is just straight out of the core. That one I cut for myself, I still have that in Tucson, it has to be here. And then the one on top is the one they chose next. And that's, that's it installed in the garden. <coughs> uh, next, okay, just two more samples of that same kind of configuration. And another variation, um, this one a bit more elaborate, but the same principle. Next, that's the back side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a detail from the back side. Here you can really see the layers of glass, mm -hmm. the laminations. Um, uh, literally, the stained glass, which I use in small amounts, you know, from the stained glass tradition, um, they look, they, in order for them to have color on the plane, they're only an eighth inch thick. But to them, to show color on that plane, if you turn it around and you cut it an inch thick, you're looking through 10 times the amount of color or pigment. Mm -hmm. Which means that if I were to laminate with most stained glass, it'd be almost black. Because mm -hmm. no, almost no light goes through. You really have, it, it's, it's a trick to try to use colored glass on it. Next. This is um, afternoon light. This reminds me of going to Pastor Paparoski's. <laughs> you can see what the light is doing in the space, not just the object. Next. Um, oh, these are, this is just a couple others from a public project. Um, we'll move past that. But instead of cutting apart a stone with a saw, you can always break it apart. So I've done this a number of times, and you just see a few here where literally old-fashioned, this is so um, analog in terms of quarrying in many states, but I, I cut uh, drill holes, put in two uh, paper spikes and then a central spike and just start pounding until the thing splits. And so on the left, that's the, that's the plugs and feathers, and on the right, um, that's when it broke open. So I would take the two parts, do separate things to them, and then put them back together again. Next. This is one that's unfinished. Um, it also is in Tucson, it needs to be shipped out. Um, one block, this is actually pretty big, it doesn't look at the pictures, but one block into four sections, and then I treat each section differently, and then they'll be reassembled once I leave them. Next. And you can see the plug, you, know, you can kind of see how the 
how they're um, right there, plug, plug those holes, you know, are part of the process. Next. Here's one, not the same one we just saw, but here is one, the pieces being gold leafed. And the next picture is these assembled. Uh, this one's actually at the gallery in Santa Fe right now, in, um, on Guadalupe Street. Um, this is three pieces. So you can see the left, middle, and right. And you're looking at it from one side. Well, if you take that middle stone that has nothing in it, and you turn it around, in other words, look at it from the other side, and go ahead next. Uh, that's the other side. Um, nothing more to say about that. Next. Milestones are low stones, which I found to be extremely unpopular. Um, <laughs> it, I, I learned something from this, especially on a monumental scale. Now, this is the very, very first one I did. It's just a surface stone, and I just cut an X in it, just to sort of see, go to the next one. And, um, I have found that any time I propose or sell something low, it goes to Asia. Mm -hmm. And and my and, and uh, I have some friends here who will correct me on this if I've got it wrong. But there's more of a sense of tradition of looking into the subtlety or looking down. You know, not Americans really are eye levels. <laughs> Everything is on this plane. Mm -hmm. And doing this. I suppose we do that, but we don't really look down. And so a lot of the, I mean, when I make proposals for larger projects, and the walls, not like this, but on a public scale, um, I don't think I've done any. Um, they always go for the, the vertical. But, um, but so these are these are river rocks, collected them from the Salt River. I mean, some of them are pretty big. The lower right, that's probably 24 inches from side to side. And again, I break them apart, or at least the, the lower one and then treat it, go to an, uh, next. <clears throat> oh, that's all, that was all for the milestones. Um, Separated public works, this is one of my earlier ones, early 90s, uh, Mesa Community College wanted a small, wanted seating in front of their library. And it's because there's no seats, and because there was a tree there, um, I decided to make a seating area that was more conversational, and so these are throne-like reading chairs. Each one on the back is essentially a sculpture. You can see a little bit of glass on the one second from the left of the top. Um, on the surface, again, you can't see the pictures are a little embedded, uh, like little tiny specks of glass. Just stick a little angle, saw in, and put a little speck of mirror glass. Uh, ne uh, next. So there's, there, there's the back, before, in the studio before I shipped them. The bottom, that pattern around the tree was based on leaves that fell from that tree, and so I used that as a pattern for the, uh, um, the tree grill. Mm -hmm. All that's not there. They tore the whole thing out. Oh, and I've not been back. I, I'm quite sure they saved the chairs, but um, next. Uh, this is the entry to the Target Corporation in Tempe, Arizona. They wanted a single sculpture monolithic out front, and I propose a colonnade to sort of lead you into the front door. And that's the way they went. Next. This probably... Um, my breakthrough, break, excuse me, breakthrough project, because it was the first large model project I got. And, you know, you sort of, this is again something I think all artists can relate to. I mean, your portfolio is pretty much what people judge you on, not what you can do, but what you've done. So especially in the market if you're working within the range of say 50,000 or 20,000, it's hard to get something for 100,000. You know, the bigger the budget, uh, you have to show a track record. But this one was my big leap because I was working on it like this, like the seating area. I was working on that level, and the city of Phoenix did a national search. Barbara Kruger was one of the finalists. That's the only one I remember myself and three others. And I got the project based on this model. <clears throat> and what what I, this is in front of this is the public employee uh, um, um, memorial for fallen city workers. So if a fireman or policeman, sanitation worker dies on the job, this is a memorial for them. So my approach was, we're living in the Southwest, we're not living elsewhere. Another black granite memorial seemed incredibly predictable and redundant. So I quoted on the Kiva form and broke it open on the south side. So this is a Kiva-like shape. It sinks as you walk down and into it. And the whole thing tips back towards the arc of the sun. So dead south, that would 
explain, but south is the open side, north is the side where those people, the figures are looking. They're all embedded with cast glass, but we can go to the next side. So oh. the, on the left or left, you can see the cast glass. Um, I go. I work with different glass factories, and this this particular um, uh, factory is in, also in Oakland. And, and we've done anytime I need mass of glass, cast, not planes. Um, he's my go-to, and uh, his factory is the original corn nut factory. And whenever I go there to work on glass, you can still smell corn nuts. <laughs> <laughs> So there, there's, there on the upper right is where you walk in. Here, is the one over lower left is where you're standing in the middle and you can see the arc. And upper left, the, the coloring in there is because there's a, is a fiber optic running above it. Um, on the lower right, and by the way, the fiber optic has failed because they kind of burn up at the ends. Um, so I, I really like passive works because they don't fail. On the lower right is just a detail of the CD. Uh, next. Can I ask a question sure. on one like this in the previous slide? You, it is so big. You are on site doing most of a lot of it. Aren't My you? studio was three blocks from here. It's downtown Phoenix in the front of the city hall, brand new city hall. This is a hundred feet from their front door, and they wanted something that would be popular with the with the population because they spent so much on city hall. And this is not, that's true. This is absolutely true. There's an incredible motivation. I was approved to do this three months before opening. And so we had to do this in three months. Oh my God. I was the general contractor, but I had people, obviously, I had a whole crew doing it. All the stonework is dry stack. See that upper left? Those are thin pieces of sandstone stacked on each other. Just like the chocolate candy. You know, with a little bit of mud behind. But no mortar. If there's mortars behind the stone, so that was that that was amazing to see. Uh, and those guys, everyone worked really hard. And sure enough, we, when they dedicated City Hall, that this was the center of all the pictures. Um, next. What uh, year was this, by the way? What year was? Well, that this? probably was '93 or '94. Um, this is a few years later. This is uh, America West Airlines, one of the plaza. What are the sculpture? They wanted this the sculpture. They were still building their low high rise in Tempe. And um, that was when America West Airlines was still around. And they had a plaza that was unplanned. So they had a parking structure, they had shaded walkways, they had a big area for grass. And then they wanted me to put a sculpture in the middle of it. And I thought, that's just totally wrong. <coughs> Block art. We all know what I think we know all know what that is. In other words, do me a sculpture, let's put it over there and let's go on to the next day. Um, I asked who was doing the landscaping, and they said, Well, the landscape architect really dropped the ball. The architect wasn't interested. So I asked them what their budget was, and it was formidable for me. And I said, Why don't you give me that budget and I'll design the whole plaza? Mm. And then um, you'll pay for all the parts except for the sculpture, and then the sculpture will be paid by my original commission. So the three stones on the bottom, the three stones on the top are my sculpture. The rest of it is um, essentially a respite from all the hardscape around it. So when a person leaves the building, they could come into these two curved seating areas, which are lower than the surrounding pavement. And each one, all that seated, you can see that arc, that has water running through it. So when you sit down, there's water dripping behind you, and then it exits where you, you can see the one here in the bottom. It exits into this little pool. This is the real thing. Wow. Um, so, of course, this is before the trees grow up. So that area there and that area there is where the water comes behind and then drops. Um, like next a picture. Roman toilet. <laughs> <laughs> to my knowledge, people never do garbage or anything. So the glass patterning, you know, was based on, it, Water. It was sort of to make a remark, sort of visually, that of water flowing. And canals are a really essential part of Phoenix and Phoenix's growth. So, and then on this one, then uh, right below it is the source of water, and then it runs down. Next picture. There we go. Mm -hmm. So that's the end of the seat, and that's the dropping of the water. Mm -hmm. And down there, that's all black mosaic, so that it feels like an infinite space. Mm -hmm. And on the right is. Um, half-inch plate glass that I water jet cut, laminated, and then put together. There's no mirror in that, we're just seeing light coming through. 
Yes. I'm going to take you through one project, kind of from the beginning. This is a, a block ordered from a quarry in southern Utah, and this is a Utah project. And that that this is the block here. There we go. And it was this is so it was shipped in, picked up, brought in, and on this saw you can see a quarry board there in the making. See that underneath that? Eventually, that'll be abraded to the point where they'll throw it away. So um, on this scale, I'm not doing it. Um, so he lowers it, next next picture, lowers the stone, rolls it underneath the saw. They used to have a 10-foot round diamond water pool blade. Now they've got this sort of, it's like a serrated knife with diamond uh, impregnations on the bottom. It would cut something like that, and that's about 10 feet by about five feet. It would cut through that in perhaps an hour. Uh, so on the first picture on the left, he's taking off the rough back. Now in that case, it's ugly anyhow. So a second picture, he's got the rough back off. Now he's cutting a flat piece, which I'll use for the fronts eventually for the sculpture. Next picture. Um, we're now getting it down to scale because I have to actually formulate this into number three major blocks. Go to the next picture. There he's making it into the blocks. Each one of those, is, you'll see in a minute how big those are when you start seeing them in, um, uh, at the studio. Um, next picture. So then I take the front of, front of pieces. These are just, a, excuse me, these are just a facade of those big rocks. These are not um, the big ones. These will eventually attach to the bigger blocks and three per level of three major boulders. And on the left, you see the rough work. On the right, I've cut now the slots where their glass will eventually be made, and this will be cast glass. Next picture. Um, I've cut out all the pieces that go, and I'm transporting them to the studio on the left. On the right is the, on the left side of the right picture, top right, you can see how it looks roughed from the quarry, and on the right, we've already smoothed it out and put bevelous in, and that's where we seat the glass in, and this is a whole three panel set now, in sequence, prepared for the glass. Next picture. The glass in this case is um, it's cast glass. They're called um, dowels, D-A-L-L-E-S. They're they're becoming harder and harder to secure because um, fewer and fewer people make them. And um, so they come in in uh, eight by um, twelve inch cakes, basically an inch thick. Mm -hmm. So that's what you see in the boxes, top left, and on the bottom. I've taken them to a water jet uh, person who's turned them into slices all common sizes. On the right, uh, on the bottom left, I've already mirrored those pieces, by the way. So on the bottom right, I'm laying them in and coating them as to where they're going to go. Next picture. Then I cover everything up with tape. The glass is covered with tape. The stone is covered with tape. And then I caulk, um, aside from an adhesive on the back, for the finish, I literally do a silicone caulk with stone rubbed into it so it looks like the stone. But it gives it a, an elastic, um, adhesive, which lasts. Uh, the right is one of those panels, and on the left you see one of the major panels with a spacer above it, and that spacer above it is what's gonna separate it from the other two boulders that will be on top of it. And here, here they are all three boulders, for lack of a better way, blocks, with the glass on and ready to go. So I ship them to Utah, and um, next picture. There it is inside. So that all started with that block we pulled out of the yard. Um, obviously, the architect and I worked together on this one <laughs> because uh, the back of the stone is actually rough. So that's the counterpoint, which don't show in these pictures. You, you, it still says stone when you go on the back side, but the front side is extremely formal. Next picture. <coughs> and that's for, uh, uh, oh, I actually said that Brigham City. Either way, um, this is a, a, a company named Pace Setter. This is quite a while. This is mid, maybe mid '90s, late '90s, and they make uh, pacemakers, and they're named Pace Setter, and they wanted sort of a high tech, high tech, low tech kind of connection between the outside and the inside. The building looked like a spaceship had just landed and just didn't see itself on the ground. So I was involved with designing this with the like landscape architect a Plaza, um, running, and then the sculptures out of where there's a turnaround. We'll show a picture of that in a minute. The, the blocks are kind of irregular and random. 
also from the same stone. And then what you have mine you see are cast glass. I think they're in 24 inch segments. And it has a curved back so that you have a curved mirror on them. And then the top we pressed, this is the same corn nut factory. We pressed a V groove on it so that it had traction. You, could, you wouldn't be able to slip on it. And underneath it is a fiber optic. And that fiber optic leads from this, between the sculptures across the threshold, which I don't have a picture of, into the lobby and crashes into um, a stone wall where I have chunks of glass all over the wall <laughs> spreading from the fiber optic or the, uh, yeah, this glass uh, source. Next picture. And this is very similar to the previous sculpture, but it's, uh, it just sort of shows a variation. Uh, next. This project wasn't built at the last minute, and literally one day before we were to start, the, um, uh, the client disappeared. And the, uh, it was going to be built in Singapore, and an architect, an American-based, uh, American-trained architect um, from Singapore, you know, had found me somehow and asked me to do a facade out of cast glass. So I created this tile-like form, eight-inch tiles, out of three or four different pyramidal shapes. Each one, each pyramid was slightly different. So each eight inch tile could be turned four different ways. And you have four modules. So by the time this thing would be installed, you know, there would be no recognizable pattern except for the eight inch grid. And um, it's all cast glass with mirror behind. Um, so next. So at, um, this was a, I did this at Kokomo in Indiana. We made uh, in the upper left. You can, well, you can't make it out, but that's a that's a model of just one of the pyramids. And from that, they made a mold, and then we, you would cast it. That's probably three and a half inches deep at the tip of the peak of the pyramid. Then where my fingers are on the backside, once it's to be built, it will be mirrored. And I don't have any. Of them. I couldn't find all my slides. Everything's <laughs> kind of all over the place right now. So, but you don't see a mirror. But that would, it would, the installation would, would have been incredible. And the way it would facet light would have been um, uh, like a diamond ring, really. Um, but it didn't happen. Next, this is the W Hotel in Scottsdale. Um, I worked with architects from uh, San Francisco on this. And the whole idea was to create, they weren't, uh, they didn't know what they wanted, but they wanted me to do some kind of a work that would basically, again, kind of anchor the, the new architecture. So I conceived of this stone wall that grew there. It's like the archaeology. And then the, the building would be built to it. Even the staircase floats off of it. This is their lobby. Next picture. This is where it goes up to the second floor on the outside. I think the first order was 160,000 pounds. Um, and naturally, in this case, you know, I had masons doing the job. I, I didn't do, all I did was put in the glass. Um, we'll go to the back side of this now. Oh, no, no, this is, this is how they laid up each line of the stone. This arc is, the sh is a section of a, like a snow cone, which is tapered. So from the bottom, the arc of that curve is tighter than the arc on top, which means every foot you go, it's a different size arc. <coughs> oh. And no one thought we could lay that, oh, this, yeah, this is something you could really appreciate. <laughs> you know, no one thought we could lay these things in without us getting lost. Mm -hmm. um, but. There was a way to do it. And then here it is, with, we, we just installed the glass and they're still building the building around it. It's a better view than the first. Next. On the upside, on the back, there's a garden. And my involvement there was the glass collet. And um, also I did a candle wall, which I have no photos of. Next picture. And then out front, in the drop off in the port of chair, um, instead of putting up golf bollards, but you can try to buy a bollard out of a car catalog, it's expensive. And I said, why don't you just spend that money plus a little bit and, and let's make benches. And so these are solid limestone benches. Each one's different. I think there's nine all together. So when you pull in, you don't run through that glass wall. Um, but, and here's a detail of the glass plugs. This is very similar to what I did at Spaceport. Next picture. Um, this is the entryway to, um, I forgot the name of the place in northern Houston, the Woodlands. And um, they have a two-lane road going in, this part of the Maquette. Two-lane road going in and a two-lane road coming out with a 
very deep median. And so I did a sequential, this is the model for it, a sequential piece where as you drive by, you'd see the flickering light as you moved. Um, next. These are the pieces before they went. All the, all the glass is arced. So that, for instance, if you're driving by and it's not, the light would move from one side to the other depending on where your vehicle is. And so it's kind of designed to experience in movement. Each, each of these stones, this five of them, were split. So this piece here fits that piece. And that piece is, of course, the original rough surface. And here we, we've manipulated them. We'll install them next to each other, next picture. So you can see the second stone over there first, and um, I, never, I never had got a good, really good picture of all of them together. So I'm just, whoops, that's not next. Mm -hmm. Where the plug and feather systems broke the stone in, in an irregular way, I sent the car back to sort of take advantage of the brakes. That's what you're seeing. Next. And the owner of um, the committee, really, for the Woodlands, they really wanted me to do a fountain. And I resist fountains, and really resist it. And they persisted and persisted, and I said, well, you're gonna to have to do all kinds of things, you have to maintain it, you have to put demineralized, a demineralized Asian filter in it, never put down fresh water going over it. They convinced me to do it, I did it. This is not with water on it yet. That's where the water pools up on this, there's a pool inside there. And then it just cascades only over that middle section. And um, I don't think it was there certainly less than six months. And I'm, I'm, it's still there, I think. But one of the maintenance people decided that blue dye oh. makes water look better than water. <laughs> Everyone's seen that. When, when it's, yeah. there's this little spray, the golf courses, you go there and it's like, what's that? You know, it's like this blue water that's way too blue. <laughs> so they put blue dye in it, and that's limestone. <laughs> and it's, oh, 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 oh. it doesn't matter how sealed it is. It is just ugly. Next picture. Um, uh, this is an installation at uh, Fashion Square in Scottsdale. The top model shows you the form. The form is going to, well, you'll see a little bit of it later, but the form it's sitting on is a stylization of the top of a cactus. And so, and then all the glass is based on forms in the Sonoran Desert. And um, I called it the Sonoran Soliloquy. The bottom is an alternative installation because of in, I don't know, maybe three or four years, they tore the whole thing out so that people could drop off the cars and have it taken to the training structure. Uh, and, and so they put the, everything in storage, so I redesigned another place for it, and that's what you see on the bottom, and that also was never installed, so it's all the glass, presumably, is in storage. Oh, wow. And it's really bleached out, but you get the idea. It's kind of brand koozie like I would take these forms, and you could, there's a lot of, this. I think, four original forms and um, from smaller to bigger, and fluted to art, art those different shapes. And um, you could stack them inverse, or you could, you know, like the one in the second from the left sorted, right. et cetera. Go to the next picture. Um, that, so on the, le the left, that's more accurate to the color. The right's kind of bleached out, but it just gives you an idea. And these were cast by that same fellow at the Coordinates Factory. Um, and, uh, um, so are they all yeah. solid, the sections? Yeah, uh, you mean each le level glass? You uh, mean like from here to here? Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, was, it was called uh, a spin casting. So um, huh. I made the original patterns, then they made a cast iron version. Each one of those sections has a cast iron original. And again, I think there's four of them, four different ones. The glass is dropped into that cast, uh, the, the um, uh, the reverse form that's cast iron while it's spinning. And what ha it has to be preheated. In the oven. And the glass starts, this is how they do glass sinks, by the way. And uh, they spin them. And so the glass, while it's still, um, uh, yeah, molten, uh, yeah, have a number. It's, um, it goes up the whole side. So those are probably um, at two inches thick. And if it were solid, the annealing would have taken a year, half a year, oh. and uh, it's just too much a risk. So, and then they're stacked on a stainless steel um, um, pipe, 
that has little discs on it. So each section, the weight is carried by the disc and goes down the pole. There's no oh. risk on the oh. glass. Oh. Oh. Um, anyhow, this is all disassembled. And if I can find it and get it back, I'm going to do it. So I'd love to rebuild this thing. Okay, next. Um, we're getting near the end here. I'm going to hustle it along here. This is, um, this is a public, this is University of Arizona and the engineering department, they wanted something for their lobby, but you couldn't, it couldn't hang and it couldn't sit on the floor. <laughs> um, it was a competition. And um, what I ended up proposing was the, were these two panels, and they're pretty big. They're pretty big and it's two layers of perforated steel with glass plugs that I had made in Utah, which you can kind of stick in and they, they're tapered, so they basically level themselves out into that screen. But because there's two layers of grid, when you actually move past it, it's a moray pattern. You know, it's like going across the, the bridge and, and the glass, and glass. So one layer of the glass is much lighter in tint and offset, and then the front has the color. And so the moving through there is where all the action is. Next. And that shows it just a little bit better, but not much. And the design itself is based on just a, a stroke of the brush. Next picture. Taking the same idea, I did an elevator shaft. So on the picture on the left, you go up in the elevator, and the front of the elevator is glass. Well, actually, it's the back of the elevator, but it's all glass, so you move past all these screens. And I pixelated um, uh, pictures, again, of cacti, and then blew them up to almost the point of abstraction. And on the left, you can almost see it in that second panel up, but you can kind of see you know, uh, um, the cactus in it. Next picture. So taking that same inspiration of that, I took the same patterns and turned it into paint. And these are not really paintings, they're more like paint constructions. But each pixel was a different color, and then I would set a mosaic-like, and so that established these patterns. And these are here in the studio. And these are not done. There's going to be a left, I'm going to suspend small pieces of cast mirrored glass above it so that there's like a reflective scrim in front of the two images. Um, and I have, go to the next one. Another version of the same thing, different, different uh, but they're all based on uh, Sonoran uh, desert plants. Red, Red Mountain Community College, that's a high-tech college and, um, in Mesa. And I was part of the design team to do all the outdoor areas. So to help design the plaza and the landscape, and then uh, an entry sculpture, and then a sequential sculpture on the <coughs> other side. And the pattern in here is based on, you know that goblin goop, but I haven't seen it for years, but when, when your printer would go crazy and just spit stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I took that stuff and then just took the pic enlarged the pixels and enlarged them. And it, to me, it was a language that no one, of course, will ever understand. <laughs> and so this was basically a tech language, tech tech like. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's where the pattern came from. Next, that's 12 feet high, by the way. I also took that same patterning and we did use it in some of the block work which you, on all the buildings. On the left is another version of it. It's a sort of a serial um, a sequence of uh, sculptures. This is a separate entry. Next picture. This is using the same idea in a much smaller stone. It's kind of a quasi marker from that series. These are all pieces of cast glass. Mm. Um, next picture. Um, there's only one picture, I mean, it was an accounting firm, it's an international accounting firm, and I forgot their name, they're in LA, and they had a head, headquarters, and they wanted something through all their hallways, and something people could experience moving by, and this kind of pattern that came out of it is how can you take a simple form and manipulate it as you walk by. These little squares, which are embedded about a half an inch into the stone, are based on 180 degrees of rotation. So in the upper left, there's no rotation, the next one to its right is one degree, if it has a center point. Each one moves one degree in the same direction. So from the top left, to that one, here to here, it's 90 degrees. So this is square, that's square, and that's 90 degrees of rotation. This is 180 degrees of rotation. And it made its own pattern. Mm -hmm. Next. I still have a few of those unfinished. Um, these are just, you, uh, uh, just almost assembling just pieces of stone and pieces of glass, um, but it's still kind of pixel-like. Next one. It's a detail, of course, same piece. Next one. 
Oh, here we are. I wasn't living here, um, but when I first saw this picture, this picture I think was out, uh, it, was, it was publicized well before they started. And I, I remember seeing it going, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> that's just not. And it did. And then I saw, a few years later, I saw a call for artists. And I was one, hundred, one of um, 206 artists responding. And, and uh, the call was to be a, uh, the spaceport artist, but to collaborate with the engineers and the architect and so forth, landscape people, um, security people, and, and create um, integrated artworks through what they call the, the um, visitor quadrant, which is not there, of course. And um, so, next picture. I got the project, I, I, I felt I knew it was mine. <laughs> I grew up in, I spent my young youth you know, in Roswell. I was born at Mojave at Edwards Air Force Base where the space shuttles were landing and where my hospital was gone because that's where the space shuttle lands. And, um, and the very first word I ever said in my life, this is actually a weird story, but um, I was quiet for three and a half years. And my mom said four. I think it was less than that. And my first word was a sentence. And I'm not going to say it the way I said it then. I'll say it in current language. I'm going to go across the street to see the rocket. <laughs> and so between those, because there was a little tricycle with the shape of a rocket. Now this is late 50s, I guess. And um, so with those things in my background, I thought, I just got this. I just got it. And I did. <laughs> And so this is a model of the whole visitor quadrant. That little cone on the right, that's the turnaround that now exists, but it, that cone shape is not there, the sculpture is. And that was not part of my job. They said, don't even look at that. And, uh, so on the left is the visitor quadrant, the, the biggest flat area there. That, that building, anything gray was already planned. But how to tie it together wasn't figured out yet. Next picture. So um, what I did was I took the, this uh, plaza, which is a viewing plaza, and oh, you can't really see it here, but all those little various lines, those are expansion joints, but all the little spots are pieces of cast glass embedded in the concrete, and it would be a reiteration of the night sky mm -hmm. at summer solstice. Of course, very, very, very schematic. That other little circle was a, co a golden color concrete, and I call that the solar court. And, and the disks of glass that would make those concentric circles would be a, a bright yellow amber and um, undulating from small to large as they did the circles. And this would be the way they'd have special events. In other words, the plaza was just too big for people to stand around and give a person an award or whatever they're planning on doing there. And then to tie an observation deck with this, I created this sort of more lyrical um, pathway. And, um, so you could see it, you know, literally from space, or you would feel it when you're there. And then I took uh, the earthen forms. I took um, inspiration from um, uh, Virgin Galactic's building. And one thing you can get out there for cheap is dirt. You know, that whole that whole runway is displaced. All that dirt is. You, anyone's been out there, you see this massive amount of dirt. So my theory was, let's take some of that dirt and 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 plant the building. And create this sort of, un, you know, kind of hug it with the land instead of having it sit on it, just like Virgin Galactic. And um, so, at the bottom, you see a swale, which is to collect, you know, water. And then you have a little swale on the right, and the mounds. And then that little area there. That's that's where that's the security area, and it's still there. But they don't have any of that burning around it. So the idea there was almost channel everybody in and make it a lot less visible. And. Um, Anyhow, that was a plan. We got this up to construction documents, which meant every single part of this was planned and bid uh, before it stopped. So at that point, they go to the next slide. They said, OK, I had a two-year um, uh, timeline. And it was somewhere after one year, probably a year and two or three months. And they said, OK, make a sculpture for the front. And um, so this was the maquette for it. Um, obviously, there were many different iterations. And it was complicated because it couldn't be anything reflective. I mean, like stainless steel. No. Um, and it couldn't be anything that would block your vision from if you're looking straight across 
the traffic circle because it would be a hazard. It couldn't be too wide because uh, SpaceX at that time was planning real large fuselages and they didn't want to hit the sculpture. So I made a model, by the way, of, of what they were going to do, and I could play like an eight-year-old, you know, <laughs> <laughs> just to see if I, I didn't want math. I just wanted to see if this thing would make it, and it would. At one point, there was talk of making this thing rotate so they could get the fuselages in, and all that's become irrelevant at this point. Um, so that, there was my proposal. Next picture. And not, not the greatest picture, but it shows you the context. Next picture. And then, of course, I embedded, and again, this is a small, just like the plaza was going to be, this is a small um, iteration of the night sky, uh, June 21st. Um, and all those are cast glass. They're a half inch in, a, in the steel and a half inch above the steel. Next picture. But they all reflect. And so that's how they do what they're doing here. And that was kind of the idea, to embrace the sky. In other words, bring the sky into something that was below it. Kind of like those agricultural pictures, looking down and seeing up, you know. Um, and you can actually make out the, the Milky Way, I mean, the uh, Big Dipper there. Mm -hmm. um, if you get in line with it, the top of that end of the sculpture is actually right underneath North Star. Uh, next picture. Mm. Uh, we, we did this on, um, uh, well, obviously it's a Milky Way picture. We never got the whole sculpture because the scaffolding was still up on the bottom, so we had to clip that off. Mm -hmm. Next picture. At more or less around the time I did Spaceport, it was getting harder and harder getting commissions because more and more people were commissioned, uh, going for them. And so my commissions, and there was a few after Spaceport, but they were getting further and further apart. And the stress from that, every artist here that's self-employed as an artist knows this, that you go through boom periods and flat periods, and, and I was just, by then, you know, um, I've been doing this for 30 years, and so the idea was take a break. Uh, University of California. The well, battery's getting low. Oh, we're almost done. <laughs> um, uh, so I, the, I, you never, I put everything in Tucson in storage, stoked, sold everything else, got an appointment at University of California to put together a public art master plan. And by the way, all through this, I was part of uh, the Scottsdale Cultural Council for six years. I helped establish, I was one of two people who visualized the uh, uh, Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. So I had a lot, and I was a founding board member for the Phoenix Arts Commission. So I also had sort of the bureaucratic experience for them to hire me as an artist who also understood the public art systems. And so that's why they hired me. And so I went there as artist in residence, as uh, the developer, developer of this master plan. That's the, that's the book cover from back in front. It was done. And then go on. I also did a few, I did some little projects which are, have not come to fruition, which is called Seven Meditations. And they're all places that would be public places where you could introspect. It's kind of contradiction of proof with something you may have seen in a few of my other public pieces. This idea of being in front of everybody at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. yourself. So this is the model of that previous picture, and it's based on two pyramidal forms, one going up and one going into the earth. Mm -hmm. and, and so if you were to walk where that cliff is on the right, walk in on that level, and that would be ground level, any side, then you can traipse up to the top and look out, or you could traipse from the bottom and look in. Next picture. And so that would actually be kind of a quiet space. That would be a, a little water um, pool with a trickle of water coming out that pipe, which would echo in the area. Next picture. Uh, this one is something I wanted to do for a long time. Here's the, some of the sketches. And, um, I call it the Temple of Eye. But really, really what it is, is a place to go and hear yourself. Uh, we've all gone into the shower and know what the acoustics are like. <laughs> well, this is walking into a sphere. And it would be uh, um, you know, solid concrete. And when you walk in at a five foot seven or five foot eight level, your, your head is in the middle of the sphere. Mm -hmm. You could hear yourself breathe. So it's a place to go, and uh, presumably it wouldn't be as gratifying if you went in with a group. But as an individual going in, you know, that's the whole idea. And then I wanted to plant it in, in some sort of, you know, there was a sketch in the previous one too, two different areas. Try to plant it in some place that sort of formally leads you into it, but it's softer. It's, and now here's an orchard. Next picture. So I've never really finished a model on this one, obviously. 
Um, and I haven't finished the form, but you get the general idea of walking in and, and having that. In fact, a lot of the um, children's museums have that where there's sort of a concave sphere, and then someone else is 30 feet away or 50 feet away, and you talk to each other. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing, but it's really very amplified. Uh, next. Um, someone put these together for me just to sort of look at the space and sections, so it wouldn't have that interior faceting, but this is the um, uh, one proposal for the, the structure, sliced in half. And um, there's the sphere. You walk uphill through an opening, no doors. Um, this is a little, little natural light being filtered in, natural light being filtered in, and that's it. Um, next picture. And here's a developmental model. You can see the entryway you walk. You walk through the slot, and you're walking up so that your feet get you closer to the exact center. And also it shed water. Um, and that's what the form um, more or less looks like. And that's as far as I got it. There's also five other proposals, which are all more organic, and none of them have been finished. So I just thought that's I'd share that as the last project. <laughs> Next picture, I think, is uh, here we go. So you can just leave it there. Um, and I'll take questions. This is what I just started. On the left, there's a model, uh, a scale model. That person is six foot high, so it's a six foot high sculpture that was to be over a mirror plane fountain, and now it's just going to be on a pedestal. This is for a home in um, Tucson. And the picture on the right is the stone itself, and I just cut that, I don't know, a month ago. So that's sitting here in town, it's ready to go, and you can now kind of see that too. Everything, that, all the slots, that's where the glass goes. And having seen the others, you can imagine what it does. Yeah.